Heavenly Father, we, we come to you and we need you. Lord, we open up your word together and we ask for it to speak. Word of God, speak to us. We know that it is uh, by, by your power, O oh word of God, that men are saved. For you are the light. And so we are speaking on behalf, not, not just of ourselves, but Jesus, the entire world that waits for you to speak. We ask that you would t- tune our hearts to be able to hear your voice. The same voice that called into being the creation. We ask that that voice would ring loud in our hearts this morning and that we would be transformed by the power of your word. Help us now, Lord, to listen and to obey, to do and not just to hear. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. We live in a day and age where lots and lots and lots of people are losing faith. Um, the phenomena of, of what it means, just, just being a pastor alone, the job has changed so much over the years. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, denominations could not hire guys enough. There was such a huge need for church planting and church growth as suburbia was growing uh, a dude could literally walk into uh, a strip mall or onto a, a corner property somewhere, hang a shingle, and, um, and churches would just, boom, spring up. We live in a day and age, though, where, where Christianity, sort of consumer Christianity or cultural Christianity, people going to church just to go to church as a social event, that's really going away. And, um, and I sort of thank God for it. I think that it's a very healthy thing to have the church be a little bit more um, honest with, uh, with who we are and our role in society. And uh, I think it's a good thing that we're not a cultural club. But one of the things that pains me deeply is that so many people are walking away from God. So many people are actually walking away from a relationship with God. Now, one of the, one of the last vestiges of American Christianity that's still pervasive around, and, um, and we all, I think we all probably know people who are like this. I'm, I'm a Christian, I just don't go to church. That's become sort of a thing. I have a personal relationship with God, Don't bother me with the organized religion stuff, politics, blah, blah, blah. And um, a certain amount of that is healthy. I think that a certain amount of that is very unhealthy because if the people of God don't get together, right? if we don't have leadership, if we we don't preach sermons and encourage one another and sing songs and write songs, we really do lose... Um, our identity. Uh, Our faith cannot just be a private expression in prayer. It has to be more than that. But even that is going away. People are walking away even from that uh, because their faith is becoming more and more meaningless. You know, first you stop going to church and then you sort of find other things to do then you sort of start hanging out with people who aren't like that at all. And uh, sooner or later, you start looking around and you go, what is this faith doing for me in the first place? And if you don't have a solid answer to that, then what winds up happening is you just sort of wander away and most people never come back. Now, many, many pastors believe that it's their job to sort of reassert Christianity into the culture, and that's not what we're going to be talking about this morning. I want to talk just a little bit about why. Why I think that happens. And the first is I'm going to, I'm just going to call the American dream. All three, we're going to, we're going to go through three things here, and all three of these things are kind of childish, and I pulled them out of my childhood. 
I, these were things that I sort of believed when I was a kid. It was sort of like three Christian life paths that you could go on in my little kid mind. And the first one I would call the American dream. It was like you go up and, uh, and you really work hard and you have Christian values and Christian ethics and you're going to become a really successful business person. Because God's going to bless you and you're going to, so you're going to become, you know, rich, successful, that sort of thing. And, and people in the business world are going to know that it was your Christianity that made you successful, right? And, and if you did it right, you were going to sort of get to the place where you were amazingly successful enough that everybody would say, man, what's the key ingredient to your success? And you would be able to say, I know Jesus, let me introduce him to you too. And then that was sort of like how you were a Christian, is you were an amazing business person. You just, you had the American dream and uh, and people wanted that. That was how you led people to Christ. And then the the second one I I would call like... um, I don't know, the missionary thing. We, we, we went to a missionary alliance church when I was a kid. And so we oftentimes had missionaries coming in from Africa or Belize or somewhere. And they would tell these amazing stories about being missionaries. And I thought, like, that's one of these alternate paths you can, I don't know, probably like back in the Middle Ages, it was akin to be joining a monastery or something, you know, this radical idea of I'm going to sort of drop all of the trappings of normal life and I'm going to get in this little fabric plane and go to the ends of the earth and tell people about Jesus and, you know, get malaria. And and it was in that world that, that, you know, there was a certain amount of nothing can touch you. People were walking into towns and speaking in tongues and the natives were hearing the gospel story story and everybody was being converted and you know somebody got stabbed and then they pulled out the sword and it all healed up and you know what I'm talking about just those stories that was the world you lived in if you were going to be a missionary that's what I thought and uh, and so it was like if you could do the business thing but you could also do the radical missionary thing and there was a different set of rules that applied to your life uh, but nevertheless you were this crazy tool of God, you know, I thought more like you'd be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, someone's going to throw you in the fire, yeah, but, but you're not going to get burnt, right, and then people are going to look and be like, holy moly, we threw three guys in the fire, there's four guys there, and Jesus would be there, everybody be happy, and then you come out and be like, I don't smell like smoke, do I, huh, that's because I know Jesus, and it was going to be like that, you know, and the third way uh, was uh, of the three paths that I thought you could take in Christianity was the family life. It, it was like um, if you weren't going to do the American dream and you weren't going to do the serve God radically, then you would choose the path that was like, I'm going to be a family man. And... And so you were going to, um, it didn't really matter what your work was. Your work didn't really matter. Um, that, was, that was just to support the family, you know. And, and really, the meaning in life was family. And if in the American dream, all of the business people would know that you're a Christian because of your success, and if in the, if in the second one, then all of, all of the, the, the um, savages on the other side of the world and all of the kids that you came back to tell stories to in church, all those people would realize that you were blessed because of the path you had chosen. Then in in the family, if you chose family as your Christian track, then those were the people who would, like, recognize that, you know, you're doing this right. You're you're the one who's really, you're blessed. God's using you to bless us. And, you know, I saw my mom and my dad and, and my Beppa and my Paca, and, 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 and I thought, you know, that was sort of the track that they had taken. It was a legitimate track. Um, and, and you had to pour all of your life into being a mom and a dad and, and uh, providing for your family, and, and then that was how God would use you. So what do we do when the rules to those things don't exactly work out. 
What, what do we do when we're chasing the American dream and our business fails? And so we start another one and that business fails. What do, we, what do we do when we accidentally get into the wrong tax bracket and we can't afford certain things and you find yourself at the food bank or on food stamps and, and, um, and you just look at your life and you're like, what happened? I chose the business track. How come, you know, what did I do wrong? Or, or what did God do wrong? Who's wrong? Something's wrong here because, because my American dream is in pieces. Right, so so we've got to figure out what's wrong here. And then when we figure out what's wrong, we're going to be able to put it back together. And I'm going to be able to have what I expected. And, uh, and what do we do when we're, when we're uh, a missionary in a foreign land and they throw us into the fire and we burn to death? You know, what, what do you do when you get malaria and it kills one of your kids when you're a missionary and you're like, wait a second, I thought I was immune to that stuff. Like I gave up my life to do all of this and now, you know, I've been rejected and, you know, Jim Elliott, if some people remember his story, he, he landed and uh, they killed him. And that was it. He didn't convert a one of them. But I, I, like, I thought that the spears would like magically go through him or something. Like, wasn't he immune? Didn't he, didn't he pick the track where, where, where he, he served God and so, and so the fire wasn't going to burn him? And what about those people who, have, who picked the family track, but their, their marriages don't work out? And it doesn't really seem like there's anything that you could do about it. And, and our Christian values that we so clung to and, and tried to hand to our kids, you know, what do you do when your dad turns out to be someone who's living a totally different lifestyle than he's been teaching you the whole time? What do you do when your aunts and your uncles that, that went to your baptism as a kid turn out to be uh, in a totally different place, totally different values, totally different, and they're saying, wait, the God that you know, that you think, you know, he's not, what do you do with that? It was a relatively long introduction because I, I want to get a hold just a little bit on w of what Psalm 10 is about. You know, because we have to have a more realistic, more mature faith than the one that I've just described to you. Um, where everything has its neat little box and it's all going to work out the way that I expect it to. It's not. And if you have that expectation... If you're still trying to cling to that expectation, it will be torn away from you. And so either you walk away from God and you're like, he's not who I thought he was. No thanks. Or you learn who God really is. And learning who God really is, there's a curve to it. I mean, it, it comes with a lot of heartache and a lot of heartbreak, but it's worth it. Because you get to know the real God. And you get to discover that whether you survive the fire or not, whether, you know, that, that javelin passes through you mystically or it stabs you and you bleed out there in the middle of the jungle, whether your kids turn out or whether they don't, um, that God is actually not obligated to follow the little checkboxes that we have set up for him. And Psalm 10 is all about that. So one, one last thing here. Boy, we live in a day and age where, um, where we're stacking up teachers and preachers who will not preach this. Uh, they will shy away from it. And they will say, hey, your destiny, God has a destiny for you. right? God has a plan for you. You got to walk in it in faith. You got to say to your problems, get out of here by faith. You got to... You know, if you're poor, you reject that poverty and God's going to give you wealth. If you have enough faith, 
Because we live in a time where Christ has done it all. He's accomplished it all. He is victorious. And see, it's just, that's just like half the truth and then another whole lie. And the half truth is, yes, all of that is true. But, but the lie is your purposes for you is not God's purposes for you. Your imagined destiny may not be what God has for you. He may have a radically different destiny for you and for me. And it may not be the rosy picture that we were hoping for. Will we take it anyway? That's the question. And so if we're going to get our hands on that, if we're going to walk in an actual destiny that God has for us, where we're actually going to let go of the things that we want to hold on to so bad, then we have to learn a little bit. I would like to read to you Psalm 10, and then we'll go through it, and I'll make a few points, but I want to read it once in its entirety. And I think that what you will notice is that the opening two lines just haunt the whole thing. It's all about what do we do when God's not around? He's not there. He seems to be purposefully hiding himself. What do we do? Listen, Psalm 10. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance... The wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. And the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. So that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Amen. The first thing that we got to do, if we're going to have a mature faith, if we're going to have a more realistic faith that lets go of our own agenda, our own imagination, and receives whatever it is that God has for us, We have to realize that questioning God, questioning God is a form of worship. Now, accusing God is sin. So you got to hear me on that. Saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. That's sin. But saying, God, do you know what you're doing? That's worship. To say, why, God? Why is this happening? Is worship. 
Why is that worship? It's worship because it says, I don't know. It's worship because it's emotive. It's pouring out what's in my heart to him and saying, you're God, I'm not. You deal with this. I can't deal with this. Look at all this stuff that's happening. Why are you hiding yourself? And I don't understand. You understand, but I don't. So why? The questioning God admits that I don't know. It admits that I'm not God. And it allows God's past character to foreshadow what I believe about his future. And that's called faith. When I look at who he's been, and I look forward and I say, here's what I think might happen based on who God's been, that's called faith. Sometimes we misplace our faith. Sometimes we say things like, because God is faithful, because he will never leave us nor forsake us, therefore I'm not going to lose my house to the mortgage company, but we do anyway. Does that mean that God's not faithful? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that we've got some big questions for him to answer. It does mean that we've got a lot of heartache for him to deal with. It means that we have a lot of expectations that are being hurt. When we can use our questioning of God in worship, we allow ourselves to explore a very wide range of emotions. Now listen to me. Every emotion, every emotion, even rage, every emotion is sanctified when it is offered to God in worship. When I'm handing it to God, saying, this is how I feel, these are the things that are happening to me. I don't understand. I don't get this. Ah! That is worship. And that's what this psalm is. It almost borders on accusation, doesn't it? I mean, listen. He, he says, In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. So he's saying, like, God, I want you to catch these guys, but look at, look at what they're doing. Look, the wicked are boasting about what they're doing. They're renouncing you. They're cursing you. In his own pride, he's thinking there's no God. He's pointing to this wicked guy and he's saying, this wicked guy is doing all of this terrible, nasty, gross stuff. And God, you're not doing anything about it that I can see. Why aren't you doing something about it? It's not that the poor don't trust you. The poor are putting all of their hope in you, God. But you're not coming through. I don't see you coming through. Why aren't you coming through? And these, these sort of things allow us to tread into dangerous territory, dangerous emotional territory, totally safely, because we have our hand in God's hand and we're continuing to worship Him and to admit that we don't know, admit that we aren't God, give God the benefit of the doubt. And finally, it also allows us to give up trying to be God, making things happen, affecting things, and pray. Psalm 10, the entire thing, is a prayer. And if we're going to have a mature faith that, that can handle expectations being shattered, we have to be a people of prayer. And it is in our prayer that we can say, God, you got to do something about this. God, we want to see you moving, and you're not moving, but we want you to move. Why aren't you moving? Prayer, like worship, sanctifies all of our emotions because it hands them to God and it says, I'm not out here trying to make this stuff happen, God. You're the one who has to make this happen. But I'm invested. I'm on your team. I want your will to be done. Use me in some way, God. And so all of Psalm 10 is a prayer and occasionally it will come through like in verse 12. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. It is our job as the people of God to remind God to do stuff. And we have to take that seriously. Now, I'm not putting the whole burden on you. I'm not saying 
hey, if you're not praying hard enough, then stuff is going to go wrong. But if you pray hard enough, then it'll go right. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that when stuff goes wrong, and we are being mature Christians, not baby Christians who go, this can't go wrong. Either you're not God, or this has to go right. We're not doing that. We're saying you are God, and yet this is going wrong. Something is amiss here. What is it that's in my heart? What is it that's in my expectations? What are the things, what's the baggage that I've been carrying around that's telling God he has to behave this way in order to be God in my life, in order for me to have a relationship with him? And so prayer allows us the process in order to do that. And lastly, we have to allow the things that are going on around us, all of these things, even if they are very, very big things, very dangerous things, very, very difficult things, we have to, in the end, know that they are things that are of this mortal world. They are not eternal. Our fear of God must be greater than our fear of man. We must value the eternal more than we value the mortal, the temporal. Because we will go wrong. We, we will get sideways if we start to look at, well, how am I going to affect things here on this earth? And I'm willing to make a few sacrifices eternally in order to make that happen. Do I have to cheat just a little bit? Do I have to lie just a little bit in order to pad my bank account in order to whatever it might be, in order to pick up a few of those pieces of my broken, shattered dream, if I, will, if I will just bend the rules a little bit eternally, will that give me some relief here temporally? And this is the, this is the story of, of chemical addiction. right? Hey, uh, what am I willing to sacrifice in order to feel good? And we have to choose our fear of God, our, our knowledge, our sure knowledge that he, that he is still God, that He is still good, that it's worth it to obey Him, even when we don't understand. We can question. We can turn our questioning into worship. We can pray. We can turn our prayer into worship, but in the end, we must assure ourselves and one another that no matter what happens in this mortal world, He gives us complete victory in the eternal. No question. And so, just one little practical word here. Um, Think about how you have reacted to something in your life that didn't go right. Think about a time when you reacted to that and then ask yourself this question of it. Did my action place God above me? Because that's worship. When we put God above ourselves, that's worship. It's our side of of the relationship. right? So when God seems to be handing us a lemon... Do we throw it on the ground and stomp on it and say, I didn't want this lemon. God, give me something different. Or do we, do we put God above ourselves? And so that's the practical question. That's, that's one of the things that uh, a little tool in your toolbox, when something goes wrong, when, when uh, your expectations have been shattered, when it's not turning out, one of the questions you need to ask yourself is, how am I going to take this thing and turn it into worship? How am I going to hold on to God more than I'm holding on to my expectations? And part of that God has to do inside of you. You can't do it yourself. Part of that God has to do inside of you. But there's one thing that you can do. Don't give up. Don't give up. We want to give up sometimes. Uh, it's, it's, it feels like you're forever behind the power curve in life. I feel that way. I feel like there's too many lessons to learn. I will never live long enough to learn the half of them. Why even try? But don't give up. Because God is enough. 
God is greater. That relationship with God, that intimacy with God, that friendship with God is greater than all the money in the world. It is greater than all of the success in a business you could ever want. It is greater than having the best missionary stories and speaking in tongues and healings and raisings from the dead. It is better than having an amazing family life where everybody loves you and adores you and everything is stable forever and ever. That relationship with God, it is enough. But He has to teach us that by allowing us to go through really difficult things so don't give up. If you can't see Him, you can't see Him in your circumstances, don't give up. If you feel like you're in the dark and you, 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 you can't see Him, but you're, you're feeling around, you're, you're, you're trying to just take one step forward in life without falling into a pit, just don't give up. If like the psalmist, you're confused by success of, of hate and evil, you can't justify the terrible things that are going on in the world with the amazing God that we know. Just don't give up. As the psalmist says, the Lord is king forever and ever. And we hold on to that with every part of who we are. And no matter where we find ourselves, we can always pray. We can always give ourselves to praying for one another and for ourselves. Remembering that, that God will strengthen our hearts. He will incline His ear. He does justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed. That is who we serve Let's pray. Father, help us to pray. Help us to worship. Help us to allow our shattered dreams and expectations to become opportunities to get to know you better, to trust you more, for our faith to grow. Help us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind us who you are. Be near to us, Lord. Do not let us break. In your name we pray.